you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, I, everything I want to talk about is trying to work with Duncan, uh, Mihai Nika, Jana Schwartzman, Jerome, and Sref Sarkar. Uh, and uh, the, the topic uh, is, is, is bisector. So, so in, in random geometry, are often called competition interfaces. Right? So, so in, so in uh, Euclidean geometry, if you have, say, two points A and B, then uh, the bisector, the line segment is is the set of points that are equidistant from, from A and B, right? And, and, and uh, it's uh, <coughs> in Euclid's elements how to, how to construct uh, one of the, one of a bisector uh, between these points. And, and one of the consequence of <coughs> proposition 10 uh, is, is that bisector is a straight line. So, so bisectors are lines that are the same in Euclidean geometry. And this is, uh, uh, may or may not be true in, 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 in general geometry, and what I want to explore is you know, what, what is it like when you do this in, in, in random geometry. Okay, so, so the setting that I'm interested in is that you have uh, H is a function, a graph of a function. Okay, we're looking at a point in this graph. We're going to look at points that are equidistant uh, from the left side of the graph and the right side of the graph. Okay, and, and points that are above the graph. So this is what we'll, what we'll, what we'll look at. Um, and you see, so, so if you look at this uh, circle here, then the center of the circle, right, is <coughs> um, uh, because the circle is touching the left side of the graph, the center of the circle is, is to the left of the bisector, right? Uh, and when the circle is touching exactly at this point, right, then the center of the circle is going to be on the bisector. So this is like a geometric picture of how this thing works. And, and, and so the bisector is going to be a straight line because it's just, it just constructs surfaces that touch uh, this curve at that point, right? So in the case that H is a convex function. And if it's differentiable at that point, then the direction is minus H prime at zero. And so the bisector is perpendicular to the, to the graph or, or set that it bisects. So that's, that's how it works in Euclidean geometry. Now, if, if H is, is a non-convex function, right, then, then the bisector is not necessarily a straight line because you, have, you may have some, uh, some initial segment which, which uh, uh, you know, the bisector kind of feels the, feels the non-convex part of the function, but eventually it will, it will sort of converge to a straight line and you can actually figure out, you know, just think about this, this uh, circle becoming, becoming very large, right? Uh, what will happen is that the bisector will have a eventual direction and this direction is uh, going to be perpendicular to the concave majorant of your function. What is the concave majorant? So it's the is the smallest concave function, which is uh, at least uh, your, your function. So it may not exist, for example, if there is no linear major end, then there is no concave major. End. But, but, but if, the, what if it exists, then that's the case. Okay, so, so that's, that's roughly how, how bisector is working with the geometry for this, for this specific setting. <clears throat> and now I want to talk a little bit about random geometry and how this works. So, so, so what is random geometry? Right, so we're, we're talking about the kind I'm, I'm interested in is basically first passage percolation, which you all know. So for example, if you assign a length one or two at random to each edges of uh, that square, each edge of that square, uh, and, you, and then you look at the shortest path with respect to that, uh, ignore this kind of wrinkly embedding. This is just a, just a illustration. Um, and uh, so, so, and then we sort of take a scaling limit, right? So this is what we would like to understand. The caveat is that we don't understand this in any first passage setting. There is no, no, sing, no single first passage setting in which we know what the answer is to, to what the scaling limit is. Now, I, I, would you explain a little bit more what this, what this line means? I'm not quite sure. Oh, so the line, okay. So, so the line is the shortest path between this vertex. This is the shortest path. path. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, so, 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 so what is the scaling limit of 
So this is a random distance, right? Between any two points in the grid. Now you have a distance, and then you want to understand what the scaling limit is. And uh, the cox durrett theorem says that if you, you know, look at this, you take two points P and Q, and then you look at N P and N Q. So you sort of rescale everything isotropically. Then you have a limiting distance this way, right? And the limiting this way, distance is some kind of norm, right? So, so in the plane, so it's characterized by its ball, for example. Uh, um, so, so in some sense, yeah, this is the scaling limit of first passage percolation. Right? But, but what we would really under, like to understand is 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 is, is sort of uh, the fluctuations of this. So, for example, we would like to understand this is another uh, geodesic here. Uh, it actually turned out to never to backtrack in the time direction, which is in some, some sense, uh, it's not always true, but generally there are very few backtracks and they're short. Um, um, so, 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 so when we look at this curve, which is the geodesic, we hope that this is <coughs> a scaling limit, right? And, 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 and this is what you would like to understand what the scaling limit, uh, what the scaling limit looks like. So there are some nice heuristics and, and also in, under very strong conditions, which are never met with some theorems, which tells you uh, what the scaling should be. So if you scale this direction with n, you have to scale this direction with, with n to the two thirds. And, and the belief is that, that then you'll get some kind of limiting curve. Now, um, limiting curve, because this thing is sort of cross the strength, is going to be actually a graph of a function. So, so, so this we call the time direction, and space is going to be a function of time. That's what that's what we expect. And this this limiting curve is called the directed geodesic. Now, you know how do you prove such a theorem? Um, you know, if you want to prove something like Brownian motion, you go and say, well, we prove, you know, the CLT for a for a fixed time, and then sort of do CLT for joint times, do things like that. Uh, but, but unfortunately, in, in this curve, we don't really have even a decent formula for, for a fixed time distribution. So, so there is now a formula, but it has an infinite sum. There isn't a formula that doesn't have an infinite sum yet. So, so, and for two-point distributions, there is no formula at all. So, so, so it's, it's, it doesn't really work that way. You have to do something else. You can just use the, the, Brownian, uh, the Brownian setting or the Brownian trick. So, so instead, what you do is you try to take take a limit of not just the curve, but the entire geometry. So, so there's going to be some random geometry. And here is the line that kind of summarizes it. Okay, so if you look at the last passage distance, right, this or first passage distance D, uh, uh, in, and we're going to go to this time direction. So we're going to single out the direction, which is going to be the time now. I picked it to be a coordinate direction, but you don't have to. Uh, and, and you put in the scaling, so two thirds and one, see? Uh, then there is a sort of a, a main term uh, and the fluctuation term. <clears throat> and this fluctuation term, just like, uh, you know, just like the original distance had four parameters, this fluctuation term also has four parameters and it's believed to be universal, right? And I sort of skip constants. There should be some constants in front of these things. Uh, and so, so this LXSYT, you can think of this as a random metric on the, on the plane. It's not exactly a metric because I, I subtracted this asymmetric term here, but it's but 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 it, it has some properties. For example, just from this 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 equation, uh, you see that this thing should satisfy the triangle inequality of backwards. Backwards is because of the minus sign, right? And that's because the d satisfies that. The error cancels and the t minus s term cancels as well. So, 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 it's, so this kind of fluctuation term itself satisfies the triangle inequality. And if you have two points, their distance is zero. It's also just follows from this. And we call such uh, quantities directed metrics. So it's a random directed metric, this L, and we call it the directed landscape. And it should be universal uh, in the sense that it should be the limit of many, many things. And I'll discuss a little bit uh, like that, a little, little bit like a little bit more about how this, this works. And I'm, 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 once you have this kind of limit, and there are a few settings where we can prove this uh, in last passage settings, then we can define the geodesics as well. And I'll see you I'll see in a minute how that is done. So you can say again, why is this? On the left side, that's just a, a metric, right? 
Left side, left side satisfies the triangle inequality. It's a triangle that's just an irregular distance function. Yeah. The model. And then, but then why do you say it's a directed metric instead of a regular metric? Uh, because, so, because actually, the so metric has a bunch of axioms, right? And this one actually just has two. And one of them is that you should satisfy the triangle inequality. And the other one is that the point distance from itself should be just zero. And, and it doesn't have to be symmetric, and it's not, as, as you will see over here. So if the time, if the time parameters are in the wrong order, uh, uh, the, the distance is actually infinite. We, we, take, we consider the minus of, minus of distance, as it's, that's just because oh, that's traditionally this is... Yeah, so it's a correction, but you can think of the correction itself as, a, as, as, as some kind of directed metric, right? Like, just like you have distances in directed graphs, and just like, you know, time from get, getting from point A to B, I think of that as a metric. It's also not symmetric, right? So there are, there are lots of lots of metrics in real life that are uh, not symmetrics, and strictly speaking, they're not metrics in, in mathematics. But you can still think of them, and a lot of the intuition that you have goes through. And so, so this is that kind of object. Um, okay, so so satisfy satisfies this triangle inequality, and yeah, so the minus sign is there because of tradition. So we first just studied this in, in uh, last passage setting, and there's just a minus sign. So instead of, <clears throat> instead of thinking of getting somewhere fast, you're thinking about collecting cookies along the way. And, and, um, and, then, once, and then this is a scaling limit, right? So, so uh, it's written as, as a scaling limit. So therefore it should be scaling variant, and it is scaling variant under this one, two, three scaling. So if you take, take a point and you rescale points so that the x coordinate is squared by sigma squared, the, the t, the time coordinate is by sigma cubed, then, then this is a process over the plane, so the random distance is, has the same distribution as the original one multiplied by sigma. So, so it's scaling variant. It has independent increments in the sense that if you look at uh, between two different times, if those time, time intervals are disjoint, then what happens in between them is completely independent. That's just inherited from first passage. And then here is what the one point distribution is, right? So if you just look at a fixed point distribution, then there is a kind of mean term, if you like, uh, and then there is a trace of them law with a positive sign. And that's essentially why we get that negative. You didn't have to put a minus here. And the trace of has a scale, which is the time time difference to the one third. Yeah. And then you will notice this mean term, we'll talk about it. This is uh, what's called the, the negative of the Dirichlet distance. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in, a little while, in a little bit. Okay, so, so this should be you know, universal. Uh, so what should matter, the two dimensions should matter. And another thing that should matter is that there are enough moments. And this is actually fairly strict here. So, so where a CLT you see everywhere, here it seems like you probably need about five moments. And five moments you don't see everywhere. So, so there, this actually limits uh, of the, the visibility of this random metric in real life. So you don't really see five moments that, that often. Uh, and uh, it's still an open problem what happens when you don't have five moments. So especially when you have just a little bit less. You don't actually know what the limit should be, what the scaling should be and stuff like that. So moments on just a lot of the weight? Yeah, just on the edge length. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so, so it's really five or four plus epsilon? Five, I think, five plus epsilon. I remember. This is what's believed, not proved, right? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. So, so this is what what's believed by me. <laughs> so not not uh, <clears throat> yeah, not proved. There are certain things in the in the we can prove that that you know some theorems break down if you have enough moments. In fact, some theorems just are not true, but 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 not not in this this generality. In fact, in this generality of first passage, nothing is proved in this direction. Right? Now, another interesting thing is that you know just like. Euclidean geometry is behind a lot of things that you see, right? This random geometry is also behind a lot of things hidden that you that you uh, that you see that is not obviously geometric to start with. And one of them is 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 you know various particle systems like ASAP and TASAP. They discovers their laws, and I'll talk to you 
a little bit more about that. You know, if you, if you have Tetris without players, it's, it's random surface growth that's, that's, that's there. This Eden model, right? Steve? which is a model of infection, if you like, the fluctuations of that should be, should be there. 2D random Schrodinger operator is the parabolic Anderson model. It's, 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 it's actually not, there are proofs uh, of, of, of some of these results. Longest increasing subsequences in permutations, uh, random matrices, that's, that's actually the most mysterious connection. Um, so the status with the random matrix connection is that is that we, we know a lot of connections, but every year or two, there is something new coming out that we don't know where it comes from. So, so there's still like a lack, of, I think I still feel like there is a lack of uh, complete depth understanding of what's happening. <clears throat> okay, so here is one thing that doesn't look like KPZ, is just a, uh, this is like a distance from Athens to Thebes, which was one of the places of the Pythagorean school. Uh, and this is how you walk there according to Google. And there's like a random environment, which is, you know, somewhat, somewhat built and somewhat natural <coughs> is what the geodesic looks like. And I think the main reason for the difference is that is this high moment. So, so it would be nice to, to figure out what this list follows. It would be a good probabilistic model for this. Um, okay, so, so, so how do we define geodesics in the directed lens, landscape? What is this object? So, so, so in order to define geodesics, you need to define length, a length of a curve, right? And then you just use it, you just define the length of a curve just like in any metric space, you will, right? So you can define distance between two points. So you take a curve, the way you define the length is you take a subdivision into pieces, you measure those, those, those pieces, and then you take the infimum because of the negative sign, infimum over all possible subdivisions, that's the length. And can, a curve is called geodesic if equality holds for all subdivisions. So that's 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 how we call a, call a so they actually the, the curve actually realizes the distance the length realizes the distance. And so so this uh, way of thinking about this way of describing the landscape is it gives you an interpretation of it as a random one form right the random one form is something that you can measure length with and it's kind of a noisy one, one form so so think of it as a as a as a one form valued noise. <clears throat> Um, one thing that's you know, contrary to these uh, Liouville gravity metrics, uh, this this uh, metric, this you know this directed metric has no coupling to any kind of white noise. So sort of have to sort of understand it in and of itself. <laughs> it's not a function of the white noise as far as we know. So so what is the what is the directed geodesic? It's just a just a just geodesic from zero zero to zero one. It turns out it's unique. It's not hard to prove. So that's unique curve, it's a unique function. And you know, first it looks a bit like Brownian motion uh, or Brownian excursion, but, but it's not. Uh, for example, it's almost truly hurled there two thirds minus, which is a set that you know, Brownian excursion assigns zero mass to. So it's very, very different. And it has three half variation. Uh, the variation, if you measure, it measures the time just like it does through Brownian motion. <clears throat> Okay, so, so there are many last passage models, Brownian last passage, Poisson last passage, and so on, where we actually can prove this, uh, including, the, including the convergence of geodesics. <clears throat> and there is no first passage model, no undirected first passage model where we can. Uh, here is a nice thing if you look at, uh, <clears throat> you know, look at the random permutation and and you look at the longest increasing subsequence in the permutation, right? So, so example, in this permutation, one longest increasing subsequence is three, four, six, eight. You, you graph this uh, subsequence, right? So the first entry is three, then you have a four, then you have a six, then you have an eight, and so on. Uh, then, then, then this graph is mostly linear. If you remove the linear, and, 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 and it has about two square root of n elements, that's Ulam, Ulam's problem, you heard of it. <laughs> if you remove the linear term, so, so, so I call this thing ln of i is the i th entry of, uh, of the longest increasing subsequence in, in a permutation of n elements. Then, then here is the asymptotics of ln of i. So, it, it, so it, it has a main linear term, but the fluctuations are governed by this directed geodesic. <clears throat> so, this, so this is the scaling limit of, 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 of a, of a Longest increase in subsequence of a random permutation. 
I, I don't want to send in the previous slide. Yep. So where no one before that, sorry. Yep. Uh so under what conditions can you get this holder two thirds? So so this holder two thirds in this. So you have a limiting object, which is you know like a Brownian motion, but it's in the in the space of directed matrix. Mm -hmm. And and in that uh, in that object, there is a unique geodesic, it's a unique random object, and and that satisfies this with, with probability one. So I, no, I didn't. What's the environment again? I didn't understand the environment. So the environment is yeah. So it's a good question. So the environment is a little bit harder to describe because it's the limit of the discrete environment. Well, okay, let's talk about the discrete environment. Just in the oh, under what condition can you get yeah, that this yeah, is the limit? So one of them is. Um, Are we still back to the exponential type? Of yeah, so for example, exponential distribution. But it's still only under those kind of, kind of circumstances. Is that correct? Um, well, no, there, there are lots of things that we can okay. prove now. Okay. But, 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 that's, but, it, but we cannot prove first passage, for example. So another well, thing we can last do passage you can get certain last passage models, yeah. But even last passage, even just you have, have very strong, strong conditions on the edge weights. Oh, so, uh, more than strong conditions; they have to yeah. be exactly certain things. Okay. That's, that's just like yeah, that's what I'm asking because I didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we don't have any strong universality. There's a strong, strong universality in the world of ASAP. So that's 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 uh, Kastash or Kari. They have a fairly strong result their result there, but but not in not in any of the other worlds. Um, and but we do have a lot of models now that converge to this that are not not last passage. But maybe I won't get into that right now. Okay, so so I want to talk a little bit about this correction term. You remember the mean term in the in the in the. Uh, so that's on that directed. Uh, picture you just showed us this, this picture oh, before that one yeah so this geodesic yes um is this directed so it, the geodesic from a to b is not the same as the one from b to a um is the geodesic determined by the yeah, yeah well it is the same yeah, yeah. But, but 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 you know like the distance of a to b is not the same as distance as the distance from b to a. a to b is some some finite number and b to a will be Will be plus infinity or minus infinity depending on the sign, and so it's it's it's, 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 it's the metric is is directed, the geodesic, yeah. There isn't a geodesic in backward time. You can never go back. In. Yeah, that's right. Let me ask if, if you if you like. Yeah, 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 that's right. So you can go back. In. That's good. I see. Okay, I see. Right. So geodesics are always functions. Time. If you reverse time, then, then this is just the reverse. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're okay. So maybe you're asking about the symmetries of the directed landscape. Okay. Yeah. And and it has essentially all the symmetries you can imagine, <laughs> uh, plus one, which is a shear invariance, which is very strong. <clears throat> okay. So, right. So 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 we just look at this distance. Okay. So this is again a directed metric, which is assigns this distance to your points x, uh, s, and y, t, which is y minus x squared over t minus f, s if, if the times are in the right order, it's zero if these points are equal, and, and it's infinity otherwise. So I set this to have positive sign. So, so this, there are two ways to, to think of this. First of all, as this is sort of the mean term of the, la of the directed landscape. Uh, so, so it's kind of if there is no noise. Right? So, so one way to think about it is this is what you get if you apply the same scaling to Euclidean distance, that the same scaling as you applied to the random distance, you apply it to Euclidean distance, you get, you get this. The second thing is the length of a curve is just it's, which, you, which again here, here uh, curves are going to be just graphs of continuous functions. And the length of a curve is just gonna be it's traditionally norm squared. So, so that, that's, this is the one that gives you that length. And uh, if you look at, you know, if you want to ask what is a ball in this metric, right? The ball is, is going to be a, a closed parabola. So it's in, at whatever is inside the parabola, this is the boundary and the center of the ball is at the tip of the parabola. Okay, so, so I want to, Connect the, this this idea of of, of, of of metrics and directed metrics to differential equations. Uh, so, 
So here is a, one way to, to think about this. So let's say that you have some kind of faraway object, you're far away in the time direction, and then you write down at the fixed time s of how far this object is from a given point. So to, to know how far is it at this point, how far is it at this point, and I call that distance, uh, actually the negative of that uh, to h y h uh, x s, right? So if you have a point x, then h x s is this distance. So, so, so if you if you think of this h x s as a function, uh, which which evolves over time, so h of x evolve, evolving over time s, uh, then there is you can you can describe what h y t is in terms of h x s. You don't have to know uh, the, where, where this, this ship was. You just need to know what you saw at at time t, right? And and this is how you this is how this evolves. Okay? So you can just figure this out. It's not hard. So HYT is just, uh, you just basically look at where the geodesic could have gone. And, and that's some kind of supremum, because of the minus sign of HXS plus the distance between these two points. And, and so when you look at this, uh, you know, this is some quadratic here, here you realize is that this is a whole flex solution of the simplest Hamilton-Jacobi equation in the world. So, so Hamilton-Jacobi equations, uh, I'm sorry if you if you know this very well, but you know, not, not, not everybody in probability knows this, but so they're basically uh, where they're describing how distances evolve. And the reason they're important, they're important is because you know, in, 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 in the physics, because of the least principle of least action, the principle of stationary action, you would like to understand uh, what how action functions evolve. And the evolution of action functions are typically uh, described by, by uh, Hamilton Jacobi equations. Okay, and then in, in general, you have lots of terms with this and, and it's in its higher dimensions, but here it is just in the one plus one dimension. Right? So the T derivative of H is just minus the, the square derivative of H squared. And, and then you can forget about this whole boat story, right? You could just think of it as an evolution of a function. You so have some initial condition and then, and then you see how it evolves over time. And, and, and we introduce this notation of so the distance from some initial condition at yt is just this, this evolution. So, so, how, so, so let's see. Um, so I'd like to connect this a little bit to, to bisectors, right? So you can, so you can now look at uh, what is the bisector in the Dirichlet geometry of, of some kind of, of the, between the left side of a function and the right side of a function. So it's the same story except except for a circle. You're not going to push a parabola. Um, and what it solves is that this the equation that the, the distance from the left hand side and the distance of the right hand side is equal. So now you can you can actually uh, <clears throat> express connect this to the deriv derivative of the solution of, of, of this hamilton jacobi equation. So if you take the x derivative of the solution of this hamilton jacobi equation, you get a Berger's equation. And the bisector in the Berger's equation correspond to characteristic lines. Okay, so if you know what those are, this is a way to solve Berger's equations. Characteristic lines are usually straight lines until there is a shock and there are some other things. Uh, but, but that actually is the, is the way to Think about bisectors in the context of classical Hamilton Jacobi equations. There are characteristics. Um, all right. And again, what is the what is the direction of the bisectors? Well, this is the same story as before. It's going to be the bisectors that are going to be going to have a limiting direction, which is perpendicular to the uh, concave majorant of your of your initial condition. So let's talk about the directed landscape, right? So you can do the same story in the directed landscape, right? So you have something far away, you, you look at how the distance it was over time, right? Uh, and, and, and then you, and of course you can't write a differential equation, but you can still write the whole flex time of type of formula, and that's what it is. It's just the same thing as we, which you saw before. Right? So, so when you do, do that, uh, h, h, comma, h something comma t, Remember, there was this uh, independent increment property of, of the landscape. That implies that this is going to be a Markov process. Because when you, when you evolve from, 
time T1 to T2, there was some evolution that's independent from the evolution from T2 to T3 because of the independent movement property. Right? So because of that, this is a Markov process, uh, actually time stationary, on the space of functions. Right? So you think of uh, some surface that's evolving over time. And, and this object is, 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 is let's call it the KPZ fixed plane, how this thing evolves. And you can think of the direct landscape uh, as, as a coupling of infinitely many KPZ fixed points together. Because you can solve all these equations together with all initial conditions. It, it, it contains more information. KPZ fixed point is a marginal of the, of the, of the direct landscape with, with some information loss. And, and then, you know, the, the evolution of this H, you can think of this as HT is, is you know, minus H squared of X, so the Hamilton Jacobi equation written in the legs. So, so this was, you know, a long time an open question of how do you actually describe and how, what, 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 if, what does even this noise make sense, right? And now we have an answer to that. So, so this, is, this is what the noise means. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's kind of the connection to, to, to differential equations. Okay, so, um, so if you take a bisector in the directed landscape, again, you set some initial condition, look at points that are equidistant, Right, uh, it solves again this equation that you're actually distance from the left hand side of the function and the right hand side of the function, and you can think of this this bisector as the characteristic of the of the noisy Burgers equation, but it's really far away from a straight line, so it's it's not, you know, it's 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 hard to this hard to write it directly, characterize it directly like we do it in PDs, but 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 now we have a definition of what this is. Okay, so here, here, is, here is some picture. Okay, so, so this is, uh, uh, okay, so this is, I think, exponential last passage here. And, and I, what I did with the gray is for each point in the plane, I drew the, drew the uh, geodesic to this, to this boundary here. This is the shortest path that goes there. And, uh, and then you get a tree or a forest, right? There's a bunch of trees. The boundaries between the trees are competition interfaces, those green things. And then and those behave like the bicycle. Um, so that's, that's like a discrete, a discrete model. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll tie all these things together, but let me tell you about one more thing, which is TESA. Uh, so, so what is TESA? So, so you probably all know, uh, it basically originated in, in, trying to, in biology, trying to understand traffic through the cell, cell membranes. But another thing that it describes is, uh, describes as, is polymer synthesis uh, from mRNA. So it's an important topic nowadays. Uh, and the ba basic idea, all you have to know is that there's this ribosome that goes in, going along the mRNA and it's making, you know, reading the code and making stuff along the way. But there isn't only one, that's the point. There's more than one. And, and, then, and then as they go along, they, they, they create traffic, traffic jams. Yeah, and then you like, really like to understand how these traffic jams work. And actually, the TASAP is a pretty good model. It's like people actually do statistics with it to, to describe these things. And what is TASAP, right? You just have particles. Uh, as you know, they have just particles on, at integer size. Uh, and so you have some particles. And the particles have some Poisson clocks. And when there's a Poisson clock rings, then they like to jump ahead. And they'll jump ahead as long as there's nobody ahead of them. So they, just the simplest model for traffic, you go as fast as you can, except you don't actually hit the person in front of you. Right? And, and then a standard thing to do is to think of uh, this, this thing as rather than evolution of a set of particles, you do the integral, like the CDF of this, Kind of random measure, so you say you go up if there is a particle, go down if there is a hole, right? And you get this kind of height function, and then you can define the evolution on the level of height functions. Particle jumping up, up ahead means right that there is a particle. This this up thing was a particle. This down thing was a hole, and then an up uh, little wedge is going down to a v. A v right? So wedge to v is is is, is how this thing. Uh, evolves. So at rate one, every time you see a peak, it becomes a little bell. That's the state of evolution. Um, it's actually funny that 
that this is a surface growth model and it's actually going down. It's not symmetric between up and down. So it's, 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 it's quite funny how, how the evolution is. Okay, and, and then I wanna tell you about second class particles. The, 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 the problem with step was that uh, this height function evolves very nicely. Uh, it actually has a scaling limit and everything, but particles themselves, they don't evolve very nicely. They really like to go to the right and they kind of just zoom past your picture. So, 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 so you don't really, the particles uh, are, are not very helpful in understanding what happens on the large scale. It's a little bit like you know, water molecules, they, you know, they're, they're not the ones to follow when you look at waves, right? It's the same story. So, so to, to correct that, uh, or to fix that, second class particles were introduced. And the second class particle can be thought of, and there are many definitions, but the one I'm gonna use today is this one. They can just think of them as a little valley. So it's just a down and an up. So if you have a down and an up in your initial condition, then as this process full evolves, you can actually fall over it goes. Right? Because most of the time it doesn't change, but if a neighboring, you know, if this down thing, if this gets flipped down, then the, then the particle just slides in that direction. So that, that's the evolution of the second class particle. Uh, is, is that clear? So, so, so over time, there's a second class particle that you can call X of T. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and that actually really captures what happens to, to taste that in the interesting regime. That doesn't zoom past anyone. Um, okay. And so, 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 so there's been a, a lot of study about what happens to second class particles. Uh, so these authors studied, uh, and, 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 and I'm just gonna mention this result, which is, which is beautiful. So if you start with narrow wedge, which is just uh, you know, this initial condition, and maybe you have to put a little value in the top, uh, then there is a theorem that xt over t satisfies the law of large numbers, but the limit is random. It's a random law of large numbers. In the, in the early times, kind of decided which direction this particle will go. And, and it's a uniform between minus one and one. So in general, this is a kind of question of how do you characterize the speed of the second class particles? And there's a lot of work in this, this area. Um, okay, so, so let me finally tell you a theorem that, is, that, is, that holds. And this is what I think we proved at Master Zeraman. And, and, and that's the following. So, so let's say that you have some initial profile. <coughs> uh, in for t set, right? some initial height function. And let's say that this initial height function in the KPZ scaling converges to some fixed function. Then, then uh, the second class particle the evolution corresponding to this initial height function converges to some random curve. Okay? And that random curve is the bisector of this initial condition. So this is how these two things are, are connected, right? So, so Tessa particles were always thought a little bit like, the second class particle was always thought like characteristic curves and this just kind of make this thing precise in this, in this limit. So this is how Tessa and, 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 and random geometry, this is one of the ways Tessa and random geometry are connected. <clears throat> so, so, so here is this bisector and we haven't really studied this. You know, what, what does this curve look like? So let me, let me tell you about a couple of terms, right? So, so what is the bisector? Remember it was, it, was it, was, uh, it was defined by saying this is the set of points that are equidistant in the directed landscape from the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And, and its direction, eventual direction is, is the limit of, of our location over time. That's the direction of the bisector. So the first theorem, okay, so, so here's one thing. So you may ask, are bisectors in this case uh, uh, lines? So what are lines? Lines would be geodesics, right? So are bisectors lines? So the answer is actually no. And that's actually quite easy to see. Because if you, you know, like if you, if you say, take a function and, and you add a constant to, to the left side or the right side, this function doesn't have to be continuous even to, to define this thing, then then, 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 then if you change that constant, you kind of sweep with your bisector the entire plane continuously. But, but you can do that with, with, with uh, shortest paths. Shortest paths actually in the, in the directed, directed landscape, shortest paths are, are fairly 
uh, they form a very small set. They, their union, if you look at all the shortest paths that are their endpoints, they, their union uh, has house their dimension four thirds. So it's a very small set of the plane. But, but these things are, they, they actually go everywhere. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, for any reasonable nice initial condition, you have the following theorem. So if you look at this, uh, uh, this bisector, it's locally absolutely continuous with respect to the geodesic. So the fluctuations are exactly the same. And, and this kind of absolute continuity you know, is, is, is a very strong statement because you can kind of recover the entire fluctuation structure just from a little piece of this, uh, this random function. You know, it's just some kind of sampling and rescaling because of scaling variance. So, so it's, it really means a lot. So they're not, they're not quite bisect, they're not quite straight lines, but their law is absolutely continuous with the law of straight lines locally. <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's one thing we know about them. Um, okay, so, um, so another thing is, is, you know, what can we say about the direction? So here is one initial condition, right? You just look at the straight line with slope. So what does the bisector do? Turns out the direction is just actually, it's perpendicular and its direction exists. So it's deterministic, there's no random. Okay. So let me give you another example. So this initial condition is just two narrow wedges. In this case, narrow wedge just means that you have zero value zero here, value zero here, and minus infinity everywhere else. Okay. So that just means you basically can't, you can't you, there's nothing there. So the, but this is perfectly fine as an initial condition for these equations. Okay, you can just ask which one, what, what points are closer to this point than to that. Um, so then it turns out that, uh, that the limiting, the di exists, so there is a direction of this bisector, and its, and its direction is normal um, and random. So just like it was uniform in the discrete setting, in this case, it's, it's normal. So here is, here is another question. So I'm gonna take now a line segment. Okay, and so, so it's, it's minus infinity everywhere except zero at the segment. And I'm gonna take the, I'm going to put it so that it's, it's midpoint is, <coughs> so, 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 so it's actually, uh, the center is gonna be at zero. I'm, I'm gonna divide it at zero in, in the ratio P and one minus P. Okay. And I'm gonna say how many, what are the points that are kind of closer to this one? This, this, this side into that side. And I can actually tell you the exact distribution of the direction of that bisector. Again, this, there's a random direction and the random direction looks like this. So, so, so you take a bunch of variables. So chi phi is just a chi phi random variable. Beta 2, 2 is an independent beta variable. U is a uniform random variable. Everything is independent and N is a normal. And then you make this kind of formula from that and that will be the law of the limiting direction. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let me tell you where this, all this story comes from, okay, where those funny formulas come from. There is actually a, a, a theorem for general initial conditions. Okay? And, and here, is how, here is how the theorem uh, goes. So, so if you have some initial condition H, the way you figure out what is the, what is the direction of the bisector at the given point, is you take H, add to it a two-sided Brownian motion multiplied by square root of two, okay? And you take the concave majorant of that sum, right? So this is the blue curve. And then you just look at uh, a curve that's perpendicular to that, that's your point. And then that's the law of the bisector, law of the, law of the bisector. And then you may ask, well, where does this formula come from? Well, you just, do this, like this is zero, you have to do the Brownian motion. So you just want to understand the concave majorance of a Brownian motion in interval zero one. And that's actually, you know, uh, that's actually uh, a result of Wacky and Pittman in 2022. So they studied what the concave majorance of Brownian motion is. And if you call that process K, the concave majorant, they actually have a beautiful conjecture which is that if you look at two, two K minus B, so what that means is you take the concave major and then reflect your thing up over it. Okay? So, so your Brownian motion is like this, you could have flipped it up. Uh, that should be a best of five process. This is still open. They know that the marginals are correct. So, so if, you, if, you're, if you may be interested in why this, where this chi five comes from, well, that's the marginal of the best of five. 
Um, and you know, this is kind of in the spirit of Pitman's theorem, which you probably all know that if you look at the, instead of the concave major, and you look at the running maximum of the Brownian motion, and you just flip up, that's a best of three process. That's a theorem. This is a conjecture. Okay, so actually, when, when, is the, when should I stop? What is the... Um, 11, 10. 10, okay. All right. So, so let me let me just summarize what we did. So we looked at bisectors in random geometry, and we concluded that there are a little bit like lines. You know? They're not exactly lines, but at least their law is like like that of, of geodesics in the random geometry. They're also perpendicular to the initial condition in some sense. Well, they're perpendicular to the initial condition plus the Brownian motion and the concave major into that. Uh, and then they are actually stay sub second class particles. So the scaling limit of those objects. Um, okay, so so I think this is all I had had to say about this story. If I have a few more minutes, I can tell you about some open problems that we have in this area. Um, and then you know, just uh, open up for questions. Um, so as I said, you know, there is no first passage model that we can do. No, she's a little bit embarrassing. It's, 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 it's not even, you know, it's not even at the level. We don't even know the scaling exponent uh, for, for, for any first passage model. So it's very sad. Um, now, it would help a lot if we knew something about at least this limit chip. Remember in the cox dirac theorem? Uh, it would be nice if that thing didn't have faucets and didn't have that many corners. So is that the problem? Faucets are just straight lines. So if it was locally, uh, you know, locally twice differentiable, that would be fantastic. That would help a lot of the theorems, although it still wouldn't get us uh, to, 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 but it would help. So this is kind of the, the limit shape problem somehow uh, is perhaps the, the most, uh, perhaps the one that has the most hope of being attacked somehow. But uh, yeah, so then, so, so I guess this is what I described was more like the convexity problem. The limit shape problem is just that there isn't a single model where we know what the limit shape is. So <laughs> that's another problem. So, so, so the limit shape, we know that it exists, but, but, but there isn't any law on, 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 on random variables where we would know what the limit shape is. Um, there's a beautiful problem. So this directed landscape is somehow given in terms of the area line ensemble, which, is, which you can think of it as infinitely many non-intersecting Brownian motions, um, uh, which there is a top where there is a top line. Now to, to make sense of that, this is kind of what it looks like. So this is a, so the top line is the airy process. This is just how the directed landscape changes if you move one of the spatial coordinates, but you fix everything else. Then, then it looks like this airy process. This follows a parabola. And then there is a stationary process between if you subtract the parabola. And then this object has the following property. If you sort of rescale, re if you pick a box uh, here, maybe these three lines, uh, you know, and forget, forget everything that's in here. So you forget these three, the segments of these three top lines between these two times. But you, but you do remember the line below. Then, then you know, conditionally, what you see, the, the, the conditional distribution um, is uh, this Brownian Gibbs property due to uh, Corvin and Hammond is, is actually just Brownian motions condition to not to intersect. Okay, and there's a beautiful conjecture due to Corvin and Hammond that there's only one such process of to say some, some trivial symmetries like translation and so on. So, so, so this Gibbs property should, should actually uh, satisfy, actually characterize the stationarity and the Gibbs property should characterize this infinitely many an intersecting Brownian motion. Okay, so there's another difficult problem that I, I mentioned actually the other day that we don't know how to do. And it's kind of the half phase problem. So, so let's say that I have a directed landscape and I cut, cut it in half. So this is the time direction. And I cut it in half, cut, cut space in half. 
And then I'm going to say the distance between two points is just the, is just the length of the shortest or longest path in this case uh, that, that, is, that, that stays in the half plane. So then I have a distance in the left half, and then I have a distance in the right half. And I would like to know whether, whether, um, whether from this information, which is the distance on the left half, distance on the right half, I can recover the actual distance uh, in the entire plane. And you know what we really would like to do is somehow have some have paths that you know cross many times, and you would like to add these pieces. Uh, but unfortunately, any any geodesic crosses, of course, infinitely many times, and and and, and the summation there seems very difficult. So we don't we don't know actually how to do this. Surprisingly, I was quite surprised. This this wasn't easily doable. <clears throat> And there's a beautiful problem called the length and shape problem, which is, which is the following. Let's say that I give you, remember that geodesics, well, they, have, they do have some direction, do have some, some, some graph of, of how they behave, but there's also, uh, they also have a length. Right? How long is this geodesic? And the length is, you know, a priori is not given in terms of the shape, but it's, it may be that it's contained in the information given by the shape. So somehow by looking at the fluctuations, at a level more precise than just saying that this has three half variation, you could tell how long these geodesics are. And, and that's, a, that's a, again, an open problem. There is a partial result to, in this direction due to Duncan uh, Dovern, and he proved that if you know the shape of all geodesics between all points in the, in the plane, then we can recover all the length. That, that, that's true, but, 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 but not for a single one. It's still, it's still a Okay, so I'll stop. Questions? You mentioned the connection with 2D random shred in your upwards. Yeah. Would say oh, so just think of think of the parabolic Anderson model. It's probably the best one. So so you so, so what is what is the best way to, to do it? So you um, You know, you you. So a time dependent potential, right? Yeah, you, you have you have a potential which is space dependent only in this case, no, 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 no time dependent. Yes, yes, and then you, and then you, you know, you solve the heat equation, multiplicative heat equation with this random potential as the multiplier in the multiplicative heat equation, and and then the. Then we actually, if this if this random potential is white noise, then in certain direction. With, with uh, Alejandro Ramirez and Jeremy Kossel, we can actually prove this, 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 this limit of the directed landscape and the KP's equation. So, so if, you, if you make your, so this is a little bit, you can think of it as sort of a finite temperature version of the, of the first passage percolation. Okay. What is the landscape exactly in this case? Because I mean, it, it, I mean the, the parabolic Anderson model is just a cold word for, for Taking our favorite sh sh random Schrodinger operator and putting it in into the semi group into e to the minus beta h. Yeah. Okay. And so, what are you exactly monitoring with this? With this. So you so you solve the right, so you solve the heat equation multiplicative heat equation with this noise. Yes. You can think of that as the partition function of some random polymer, right? Yes. Yes. Now you look at what is the what is the partition function between two faraway points where it's, you have to adjust the distance and the time. Okay, so that's a random variable. And then, and then if in, in the right kind of limit, for example, we can show that this random variable converges to a tracy rhythm distribution. So the partition function is the matrix element it's of matrix e to the minus beta h? Yes. 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 But you have to, it's important, it's important you have to adjust this thing well. We, we don't know it in many regimes, we just know it in one specific regime. And there, there are many regimes that it should hold, actually, but including regimes that we, we don't know how to prove. <clears throat> right, uh, in one, you have a one dimension and you have a space time potential, which is random. Yes, and that, can, that represents a kind of an environment for you, e to, the, e to that weight. And then you look at ground motion along those weights. Yes, it's very close to. And take the logarithm that gives you that gives you yes uh, so so that, that gives, gives you your Hamilton Jacobi equation and in turn Berger. yes so that's kind of the the, the viscous version of this inviscid yeah. Berger's equation is the KP's equation and 
And yeah, so so there's you know, like there's proofs that that converges to this directed landscape, or at least uh, some marginals of it. And there's one due to uh, Castell and Sarkar, and there's one due to me. Uh, now in, in fairly big. So, so in this you, kind of what can you say in that in that case? I think that's sort of quite an open problem, right? Um, no, mostly that is done now. So yeah. So so the, so one thing that you can, can you do. So one thing that you can do is you have you you, you know you have some initial condition, and you evolve your equation. And then you apply to the KPZ scaling to the KPZ equation, then the evolution of that initial condition, well, you have to take logs, will converge to this evolution that I, I, I gave you. That is this, this KPZ fixed point that, that, that you can do. Any other questions? Not the best thing, balance again.